Welcome, everybody. My name is Angie Peacock. I'm a psychiatric drug withdrawal consultant and a healing coach. We are on our fourth of five interviews with the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices. Today is Dr. Alexis Ritvo. I'm going to read her very impressive bio so that you know who we're talking to, and then we'll jump right into the questions. So Dr. Ritvo serves as the medical director of the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices. She is board certified addiction psychiatrist and assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She has been the program director for the CU Addiction Fellow Psychiatry Fellowship since July 2020. She is also the co-chair of the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group with the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse, which she co-founded with Dr. Stephen Wright. He's the former medical director for the Alliance. She has a pas passion for psychotherapy, teaching and improving health systems and policies. Her professional goals are number one, to increase psychiatry residents' competency in evaluating and tre treating substance use disorders and physical dependence to benzodiazepines and general outpatient psychiatry. And two, to improve patient access to psychiatric treatment for substance use disorders and physical dependence to benzos co-occurring with other psychiatric disorders. Thank you so much for your work, Dr. Ritvo. Thank you so much for having me. And it's great to see you again. Great to see you. The last time we saw each other, I was actually on the consortium with you as like a veteran's voice, yeah. but I, my plate was too full and I had to step down. I'm really sorry, but I Completely love hearing about what you guys are doing. We, we are always all juggling many things at the same many, time. Many, many things. Yes, we are. So thank you so much. Okay. So you guys, I have tons of questions for her and I don't even know if we're going to get to all of them because I know you have burning questions too. And I actually have a few patient questions that are specific, okay. um, you know, just about ben Benzo. So let's start off at the very beginning. What inspired you to become a doctor and to specialize in addiction psychiatry? So I have uh, not chosen an original profession. Um, I come from a family of psychiatrists, actually. So I'm third generation. My grandfather was a child psychiatrist. Um, both my parents were psychiatrists. Wow. Um, who met at University of Colorado Residency. And then I also married one of my co-residents. So I haven't, as my dad would say, I've not had an original idea. Um, uh, we, we haven't had an original idea in th three generations. Um, I figured if my parents and my grandfather uh, enjoyed so much what they were doing and got so much meaning and satisfaction, it must be pretty interesting um, and found that to be the case. And then undergrad ended up studying social anthropology with a anthropologist psychiatrist um, uh, looking at the role of medicine and culture um, and then specifically addiction psychiatry that's my father's subspecialty um, and my best friend growing up who's basically my other sister um, is in long-term recovery and I you know witnessed her really struggle and then at the same time really get her life back when she um, was able to accept uh, her you know that the way she was doing things was not working for her um, and I just find it to be a field, uh, with not only great need, but a lot of hope. And that if you can, um, hang in there with individuals, you can really see them, um, find, uh, help them, uh, find the important things in their lives and get them back and give them, um, hope. And then, uh, yeah, that led to interest in just prescription benzodiazepines. Cause even though the vast majority of individuals struggling with that, it's taking them as prescribed, um, the physiology obviously comes, you know, involves withdrawal and tolerance and things that we're learning and treating um, in addiction psychiatry. Well, so that, that makes me, this is not a pre-scripted question, yeah. but it makes, I always like to ask this, like, how did you figure out that benzos were a problem? Like, where did that, how did you I mean, figure I this think, out? Well, I think you see, I mean, I say we have patients come in and they're often of kind of, you know, there's two, uh, I mean, it's everything's on a spectrum, but two extremes, which is some individuals where, you know, they just want the, the, the pill because of the way our culture is set up of, I, there must just be something that can solve this problem. I don't feel good. I want something to solve it. Hence how we ended up with our opioid epidemic. Um, and then on the other end, some individuals um, where, uh, and sorry, the individuals that you're trying to prescribe a medication where you're also trying to help them see, I can, I, we can find medications that may help stabilize your base, but they all come with risks. Mm -hmm. Um, and the more we add, the more risks. And sometimes we start just chasing side effects. Um, and usually most of the work that will be most beneficial is some therapy and getting them connected to therapy and other supports. 
Um, um, so what, you know, we want to use the medications to help stabilize their base so they can participate in therapy if they're, they're not at a point where they're able to, um, but also using as many other non-medication things as possible. And then I think on the, the other end, you have patients come in um, who may be able or willing to do something like therapy, but aren't at the, but they're just not capable yet of participating. And so trying to really figure out when is a medication indicated because it might be helpful. But with benzodiazepines, what we frequently see is, I mean, they work well, right? They work real well and they work quickly mm -hmm. um, when they are started. And so people either come to know about them and ask for them, or on the other hand, in primary care where docs have very little time with patients, a lot of patients, patients presenting with a myriad of problems and distress, um, it's a quick answer, whereas trying to make sure how do I help them find access to a therapist that they can see, that they can get into, that takes their insurance, that might do the mode of therapy that would most benefit them, good luck, right, doing that in 15 minutes. Um, and so, you know, in a 15-minute visit, they'll say, well, I think this medication will help you, but then they don't know when they're going to follow up with them. They give them the default, you know, 90-day fill or the 30 days with two refills, they assume that because either the patient asked about the medication or it's such a well-known medication, you know, that they don't necessarily provide much um, uh, detailed informed consent about the risks of the medication. Um, and then next thing you know, as we know from the studies, people end up, vast majority of people being prescribed, these are getting them as continuation scripts. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of people did not understand that um, definitely once they're on them beyond two to four weeks, it's only a matter of time before pretty much everyone will develop some physical dependence. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's just, an, unfortunately, a side effect of how our med medical systems been set up. Um, I do think our newer generation of doctors that trained either during or after the height of the opioid epidemic are more sensitive to this risk because of what we saw with opioids. Mm -hmm. However, I also think that risks the pendulum swinging the other way where you have people getting stopped or, or um, tapered way too quickly. Yeah. And then they become destabilized or uh, the prescriber enters into this like power struggle with a patient where they're not understanding, you know, the patient is in distress. They don't, they don't want to feel this way. And they realize that this medication likely isn't helping long-term, but right now the thought of doing something different and potentially feeling even worse is more terrifying than just trying to stay where things are. Yeah. So. And that point right there that you just made, the thing that I see the most is because I work with people that are tapering or off is a doctor's failure to see withdrawal with the withdrawal syndrome. They medicate that. And then the person mm -hmm. ends up on more. So yep. I, my next question is like, can you talk about the, the Alliance? Like what are, what's your focus as medical director? What's your focus on the Colorado consortium maybe to help solve that problem? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, first and foremost is to make sure that we're filling in the gaps of the knowledge. Um, uh, yes, they were supposedly taught this in medical school, but you're also basically drinking from a fire hydrant of knowledge in medical school um, and uh, may not, you know, come back to this until you're the one prescribing. Um, and then you're also still, you know, in this steep um, learning curve of all the processes and things that you have to do in different clinical environments. So, you know, filling that knowledge gap, making it really clear, giving prescribers the information about like, these are the things we really need to think about with, with these meds. When are they truly indicated? And if they are truly indicated, how are we going to limit that they are short term and not long term? Mm -hmm. um, and then if we're going to engage in patients and tapers, how do we do that in a truly patient centered way? Um, and not make it some sort of power struggle. Um, so I first, um, the, I knew of the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention, while the name doesn't fit exactly what we're doing with benzodiazepines, because it started with the opioid prescription opioids. Um, they have such a strong infrastructure and they actually um, have, they have a, a designation under the state of Colorado and receive funding sources from Colorado for provider education. Um, so it became kind of a natural fit as we were looking to um, develop more of a um, network first within Colorado, but then ultimately, um, I think the beauty of the pandemic and virtual world uh, 
was that it allowed us actually to connect with people that were doing this work across the country and could see that there was such an interest and a need um, to really focus on how can we increase prescribers awareness? How can we look at advocacy um, opportunities? So in Colorado, we were able to pass legislation to limit the initial um, prescription that an individual would be prescribed of a benzodiazepine if they have not been prescribed one in the last 12 months. Wow. Um, unfortunately, you know, I wish the rule had been set that it was for two weeks instead of 30 days. I know um, I was going to ask, was it two weeks or 30 days? It was 30 <laughs> was days. Darn um, it. Uh, but at least it's still something. I mean, it's yeah. still not the next, the question of what's next and making sure people are educated about that. Um, but at least it was a, a initial step in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and it was just good to see that, that there was actually worked. Yeah, yeah, because it worked. Yeah. Yeah, too much pushback to getting it um, approved. And a lot of that was the fact that they they built upon what had been successful with prescription opioids mm -hmm. and applied some of that to the, these other controlled substances. Um, and so I think, so that was the, the consortium side. And then through the consortium and Dr. Stephen Wright, um, who was at the time the medical director of Alliance, I started working with the Alliance as Dr. Wright retired, they were looking for a new medical director. I try to help them find a new medical director and we had difficulty finding someone that had enough kind of knowledge of the issue with the benzodiazepines and all of a sudden a light bulb went off and I was like, I wonder if I'm allowed to be contracted even though I'm full faculty. And it turned out I could be since it was a nonprofit. Um, and so then I became the medical director. So on the Alliance side, I'd say we work more on the kind of national level mm -hmm. trying to help you know, first prevent the problem by helping, how do we decrease initial prescribing? Um, how do we, you know, do things like collaborate with the FDA and other national organizations? How do we work on, we've tried various ways to try to encourage development of a national prescribing guideline for benzodiazepines. Um, we haven't yet succeeded in getting the first part approved. Actually, our hope is now that the FDA has approved um, developing a deprescribing guideline, which um, ASAM's taking up, um, that once they realize the, the limits of the existing evidence, um, that we'll be able to say, well, here's why we even more need a, a national guideline. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I, I think we're all kind of trying to work in this space at, a, at the various local kind of state, federal levels um, through education policy, um, public awareness, um, and just make, make as, as much impact as we can. That's awesome. Now, speaking of which, this is a, a tangential topic, but the other day I was listening to Vinay Prasad from UCSF. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's, he's a doc. He's an oncology okay. doc, but he's like super into research and stuff. But anyway, it was just some silly podcast yeah. I was listening to, but it was so fascinating to me because he was, he was interviewing two other doctors and they were all talking about CME and they were like, how dare you, you know, insult our intelligence that we're not up to date on the latest research. Like, I don't have time. Don't tell me to sit and take some stupid test. And I'm just thinking back to our Bernie conversation where Bernie said, you know, you, you guys have trained 4,000, you know, doctors and, mm -hmm. and what is it? The, the statistics say like only 10% will actually use. Ugh. Mm -hmm. So, yes. so where's the hope? Help, give me some hope. That's what I need. I think the hope is you have to do, I mean, and this is what we saw. I, I mean, I know I sound like a broken record being like, I think we have to take what we've learned with opioids mm -hmm. and what was or wasn't successful and try to apply it um, because we have a decade worth of, you know, approaches. I think it's a combination of approaches. I think CME is great. It's most helpful when people feel like, you know, is it given by someone they know or if they have a question, do they have someone they can outreach and follow up? Can you provide some sort of mem uh, mentorship? I keep looking for opportunities to set up more of kind of a, like a hub and spoke kind of model is what they call it with, with um, opioid treatment, um, where I could provide consultation for to primary care or something. Cause obviously I, as one person in, the, in even just the system I work in, the University of Colorado Health System, um, can't see all the patients that are interested or motivated to try to do a, a benzodiazepine taper. Right. Um, and it just wouldn't be an effective way to get the work done and try to impact the most people. But what I could do is one, like, you know, try to provide consultation is something I know you're familiar with, yep. Yep. um, to more providers. And then for the more complex cases, 
that's when you you refer into the 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 hub you know get more um specialized care and then it once stabilized or kind of on a clear trajectory you transfer back out to say the primary um so looking at different models i've actually contacted um individuals through ucsf they have for for substance use what's funded called the substance use warm line Mm -hmm. where any provider can call in to get basically consultation about a patient with a substance use issue and i i was like do you like, do you guys ever see a need for this with prescription benzodiazepines? They're like, you know, we do get questions about it. And so I, I, um, the, the head there was like, well, if I see a funding opportunity come through, I will let you know and we can collaborate because I think that would be a great way because I think that's what people want. Like they, it's not that they don't want to help. It's that, you know, all the, especially in primary care, I mean, when you're trying to tackle so many things and help a patient with so many different things. And then you have this thing that, that is full of so much, I mean, it's just such a complex issue of someone's feeling distress. They're taking a medication that was supposed to help that. Now there's a question of it's making it worse, but it's causing a myriad of symptoms, some of which seem maybe, you know, obviously related, many don't. I mean, this is where I've likened this um, protracted withdrawal, which I know you've heard oh, now. I'm well aware. The, I'm well aware. Um, <laughs> yeah. Bind, you know, bind, bind. As we're trying mm-hmm. to kind of name it that, um, uh, I think it's kind of like long COVID where we need to accept there is because everyone's nervous system is unique um, that it presents in many different ways um, and there's a waxing and waning and we need more research to kind of pin down what the the most core symptoms are. Um, But just because uh, you can't, you know, you can't see it and we don't have a test for it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, and I think we've seen that with long COVID because we've had so many patients present acutely because of how quickly, you know, mm-hmm. COVID onset. So again, that's another model I think we need to keep in mind and see how we can leverage, um, you know, some of the things they're doing to get more research and more focus um, to do for um, individuals that have been ne- negatively impacted by benzodiazepines. I love that. I also, I have also found in my own work that it's easier for doctors to hear you or understand or policymakers when you piggyback on another um, topic that they do understand. So mm-hmm. everybody, it's, when you say suicide or major depression or socioeconomic, you know, they, they understand these concepts and you have to like slide in our topic with that. Otherwise yeah. they, they're like, what do you mean benzos? What are those? I don't, never heard of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. I think, yeah. So opioid epidemic over, you know, an intentional overdose, suicide, co- long COVID, all they of those. They can hear those. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's get in the weeds. Um, I see lots of clients stuck on benzos. I see a lot of fear. Like they're, they're afraid of their cuts. Very, very rarely is it only one drug. Sometimes it's multiple. So I guess, can you take us through the weeds? Like, first of all, what's wrong with benzodiazepines? Just for those that are listening, that there's lots of caregivers and parents in my audience like what is the problem with being dependent on benzos and then how does a person successfully deprescribe them? Mm-hmm. So the, the problem, like I said, that, you know, they work initially very well. Um, they are uh, helping increase. I mean, they have this nice unique mechanism. So GABA, your main inhibitory um, neurotransmitter, helping quiet down your nervous system. They not they don't just um, increase GABA, they actually have a unique mechanism where they attach to GABA and increase GABA's pull of chloride in the negative ion and increase the negative um, charge of, a, of, of the GABA receptor. Um, so that's great. You're feeling nervous, anxious, you're having trouble sleeping, you know, inhibiting your nervous system is gonna help with all those things. Unfortunately, what happens, and and we don't know why for some people it happens sooner, for some people it happens more severe. Um, we do, you know, we know, we always know that if you're taking a higher dose, you're taking it for longer, um, you're taking more than one in that class, you're taking it in a combination with other sedating meds, I mean, that all those things will increase your risk of a withdrawal and a more acute and potentially prolonged. But other than that, I've, as you have too, seen so many people that it was like, they were taking what many would think is a lower end dose, even though it's of one of the potent benzodiazepines. Um, so I think what people don't get is you have this very powerful med working on your nervous system and it really, um, 
I mean, they were only studied often for a few weeks, most of them for up to four months, um, uh, not with the indication of chronic administration. And when you administer it chronically, um, our nervous system always wants to create homeostasis and balance. And it's saying, well, you're sedating me a lot. And my goal is to make sure I'm awake, alert, functioning, breathing, you know, um, able to run away if I need to, if there's a threat. So I better upregulate all the, the excitatory neurotransmitters to keep myself doing all those things because I've had this chronic increase in how much uh, uh, kind of inhibition I have, or if you want to put it in car terms, you know, mm -hmm. like if you're using a lot of brake, you're going to, the, the car kind of starts put trying to use more gas. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, as a result, what happens is your natural endogenous GABA decreases because they're saying, well, I have so much more activity going on in my GABA system. I don't need so much. So I'm going to back off on how much natural um, endogenous GABA you have you get a down regulation or decrease in the GABA receptors as a whole, again, trying to decrease the, the level of inhibition in your system. And so overall, um, you actually get a decrease in the inhibitory system because it's trying to overcome being so inhibited. And at the same time, it's also increasing all the excitatory. And so that's why people start to feel more, sometimes more anxious, or now I can't sleep or I'm more irritable and, and so this is the, the building of tolerance, right? Because suddenly you need more to get the same effect or the previous amount that had effect is not working. Um, they also see, have uh, found some evidence of what they call uncoupling of the um, effect that the benzodiazepine has on the receptor. So it stops being as effective in pulling that the chloride ion to the receptor. Um, so again, you would need more to get the same effect of previously. So you basically just get this breakdown in the system when you start taking it more, where not only have you now, you need more to get the same effect. It's actually, and you, it's chicken and egg. You start, you know, it's easy for people to be like, oh, I must just still be more anxious or not able to sleep. The two main reasons it gets prescribed. Um, but more often than not, it probably is that you've built tolerance and now those symptoms you started it for to treat are not only untreated, they're made worse by the medication. And that's the thing. And Cause even me seven years ago, I said, I need these medications. I have bad anxiety. That's what yeah. I have. I and never... I feel worse if I don't have them. Yeah. And, <laughs> and in my own story, I thought it was the caffeine I was drinking. So I quit caffeine. And then I thought it's the cigarettes I'm smoking. So I quit the cigarette. I never thought it's which probably time. weren't helping. Right? No, but and I'm glad to get the... rid of them, but it wasn't the root of the problem, you know, cause it, yeah. it is like that. Like I, but I'm anxious. What do you mean? It's the benzo causing it. That's not yeah. an idea I've ever heard. And that you feel, I mean, I think what we as providers forget when we go in and try to tell people you shouldn't be on these long-term or I'm worried about how these will affect you is that people were starting on these by a prescriber because of their anxiety or distress, or even though it's not indicated for trauma, a lot of people get put on it because of the distress and, and anxiety they feel due to trauma mm -hmm. um, because it's so prevalent. Um, and the idea of, not, you know, uh, of, well, if I don't have this, what am I going to have? At least, you know, the devil, you know, is better than the one you don't. Yes. Um, I could feel worse than I already feel is a really scary prospect or coming off of this would make me feel worse than I already feel. Yeah. And I, I feel like that's unfair to patients to not warn them that it's, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to put you on a drug that we don't know what's going to do long-term and we don't know when you'll be able to come off of it or if you ever can come off yeah. and how hard and it you, could be. That's not, and we don't know enough. We need so much more research about, I mean, I, as I've been, uh, I oversee the curriculum for our third year med residents and our, and our addiction psychiatry fellows in addiction. And then I always, end up at making sure they have at least one lecture about benzodiazepine tapering Good, um, yeah. and bind, um, if not more. Um, and I uh, tell them, I'm like, you will always do better to go slower because we can, like, we can have some prediction of who might have difficulty tapering, but you will do much better if you try to help a patient see that we do a low decrease, they tolerate it and we get their, like, buy-in that this could is a process they're going to do okay with mm -hmm. um and that we support them in it rather than try to take it away too quickly have them 
feel horrible, destabilized, not be able to work, um, you know, and then they're too scared to do anything further. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And Mm -hmm. the end goal, if we can get people off, great. But if we can get them on less, that's still a huge win. And it may be that we get people down to a little bit and find that right now we can't completely stop it. That's okay. Yeah. So most of these groups online, which is another tragedy to me that I couldn't believe, like, what do you mean there's patients online tapering a drug without their doctors watching? Mm -hmm. Like that was shocking to me, especially because I had a degree in psychology at the time and I went to a medical school and like, that's, I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Where's the doctors at? I don't understand. So most of the advice in the groups is either a daily liquid micro taper. So patients will have 300 milliliters of water and they taper one milliliter a day. Sometimes they hold for holidays or birthdays or uh, they just don't feel good. Yeah. Another recommendation is five to 10% every two to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I see a lot of patients, they start out like really low, like 2% just to see like, how's my body going to react? Like, I'm not really sure. So those are the three ways that I see mostly and people either do liquid they get it compounded or they do tablet where they weigh it and then they scrape off a little bit and they, they do it like that. So tell me, what do you think of all that? And like, what is the recommendation and what are you teaching? Yeah, it, there's so many factors that depends. I will say the patients, many of the patients I get referred don't have either the cognitive ability to do it. So like I have some elderly patients that are already showing signs of probably are developing dementia in addition to being on a benzodiazepine long-term, which is not helping their cognitive impairment. Um, or I have some other patients where just their health literacy level is not one that they um, have the, they're gonna be able to understand or have the resources to do something like micro taper. Um, so then you, I mean, you're doing the best you can with what you have, right? So um, for some patients that let's get you over to Valium and let's decrease by, it, do you feel like you can quarter the pill? Do you feel like you can, you know, at least half it, can we get you a liquid preparation? Um, Because at least there is a, you know, Valium does have a liquid preparation. Clonazepam does too. I don't, I mean, I don't cross taper people to clonazepam, but if they're on that and they're leery of going to diazepam, um, we might try to get that. Um, So it's, it's kind of, you know, there's always so many factors contributing to what you can do. Um, With the other ones, I mean, I, of course, like all things, we need more, more research. Um, ultimately, I think we need to develop a different um, formulation a great idea. Um, wow. that has um, a much smoother um, long-term decrease. Um, because no matter what, when you're taking something um, by mouth, it's gonna, you're going to have these fluctuations. And some people, as we know, are extremely sensitive to those. Um, so I think it's what you know, it's what works for people. I think the other part, we just can't, you know, you can't quantify, but you can observe and and people have to try to figure out for themselves what works is trying to weigh the risk and benefit of, you know, the more, like the longer this is going to take, how much is there psychologically, does it become reinforcing of just constantly trying to be aware and scanning and heightened awareness of what am I feeling, thinking all the time, and am I feeling horrible, and then withdrawal versus, trying to go a little faster, but at some point, you know, everyone just has to try to do the best they can for themselves. So what I think is best is supporting the patients and walking them through some of the options um, and trying to make sure, you know, if they're like that, they're limiting the variability as much as they can Mm -hmm. um, with whatever approach. Um, I would say for the patients I have that can't uh, are not going to be able to either shave a pill or pipette or um, then I'm just trying to h- help. And if I can enroll a, fam- a supportive family member to help with a pill box and with cutting pills and keeping track, um, that's been a really useful um, thing. And and then trying as best I can to at least stick to that like five to 10%, two to four weeks, but always telling them like, if you start to feel like things aren't going well, then we'll just pause. Like there's nothing wrong with pausing. Um, uh, you know, that, and, and I will regularly tell patients like, just so you're aware, you know, I hope you're celebrating the fact we've already decreased you by like 25%. That's not a small amount. Um, and that's that much less that your body's dealing with. 
Um, and also making them more, like I said, you may need that. We may need to pause or stop when we get near the bottom. You may need to yeah, take a break. You, you may find, we may find that for now, this is the set point your body's at and it would be greater risk to get you completely off mm -hmm. um, than to keep you on a little bit. If that, you know, while always trying to work with them for what their goal is. Yeah. I like that, that you said that I, I go through that a lot with my coaching. Like I want to identify, like, why does, why do you want to taper? What is your hope? Who are you going to be after this is over? Who were you before? You know, um, that's really important to me because when a person hits tolerance or if they hit a wall or if they're like really struggling, I need to know that to help them mm -hmm. remember, like, this is why I'm doing this. I am curious. I want to know what it's like to feel good again. I want my life back. I want to feel better. You know, there's all these reasons, but also I always recognize that you know, it's not so cut and dry. Like the groups are great and they're double-edged swords because like, there's some really scary stories in there and it scares people. And then they want to be talked down, but there's no like right way to do it. It's like, whatever way is going to work for you. Yeah. Including your belief system. Like I find that is not an, a small thing. Like if, if a patient thinks I can't do this without a doctor's help, then we have to go find them a doctor. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are like, I don't want nothing to do with a doctor. I'm going to do this myself. And the water taper is the only one I can cognitively comprehend. And that's what I'm going to do. Like, so I just want to make a point. Like, there's so many different ways. You know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, ideally you would have someone involved or whoever's um, prescribing is at least willing to try to learn some more about um, benzodiazepines um, and um but you have to meet, you have to meet patients where they are. I mean, this is where I also think, and I'm like, Oh, I can always use more and more training in it. But, um, I don't know if in your training, you did much motivational interviewing, but I, I, think I do that all like, the time. All yeah. The time. It's like at the core of all of it. It's not, yeah. you know, this is about how do we help the, the patients, clients that we work with identify what's important to them, yeah. how to help them move towards that. Mm -hmm. Um, what's getting in the way of that change, where's their ambivalence. Yeah. Um, and, um, our goal is not to tell them what's right or wrong, um, or exactly how to do what that, to do. but yeah. yeah, to recognize that they're the, the expert in themselves and that we can offer some other information that may help them in that, in pursuing that. That's it. And also, well, and that brings up, that brings me to another question. I, I see fear is so much of it, fear and suffering. Like that's. <laughs> Like these are not for people listening that have not experienced this. It's, it's very intense. It's like for some people it's very severe. It's, you know, minute by minute. It's like very hard, even when they make a tiny little cut, which seems like so insignificant to us, like they feel it, you know? So I work with a lot of fear and a lot of suffering when it's really intense. So can you maybe talk about that? Like when people are on multiple drugs or it's really, really intense and severe in their intolerance, things like that, what do you see as helpful or. How do you kind of work with that, th those situations? I mean, it's I not think, everyone, it's not everyone. Yeah. 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 I think, I mean, one, making sure they have, um, supportive people in their life, um, that they can just, you know, at least tell what they're going through. I mean, I know how many people say, you know, my family doesn't believe me, um, or my doctor doesn't believe me or my, you know, who, whomever. Um, so that's, a pretty a very invalidating place to to be and just contributes to your sense of fear um so i think the importance of yeah you, i mean you need to feel connected and supported um because loneliness uh will only drive um that sense of fear um i think it's really uh important to to find the things that you still get some enjoyment from and even if you can't do them to the same degree um, making sure to make time for that. Um, and that includes I, one of my colleagues that's a geriatric psychiatrist and we supervise on the same day. One of her favorite questions to ask patients is, you know, when did you last go on a walk in the sun? Um, and, uh, and then that will be her prescription is, you know, go on a five minute walk in the sun. Um, and so, you know, I think remembering it doesn't have to be, you don't need to be able to run a marathon. Um, uh, you don't even have to run. Um, and if you can't, if walking's hard, you can sit in the sun, like, but like find those things, those moments, the small things that are meaningful ways to connect to other people. Um, try out some other skills and we have some good evidence for things like mindfulness and for, um, for some people, the, 
like, oh gosh, what I'm, um, biofeedback yeah. works well, where they get a little more, you know, things that they can actually see the variability in their heart rate um, and learn to control it some. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to teach my patients about the the diving reflex. Um, so it's called, have you ever heard of that? The mammalian diving reflex. So you have temperature sensors under your eye. Um, and if your body, if the, if you put something that's cold on them, so like a, a cold wet washcloth, you can submerge your face in water. But if you don't mind that kind of thing Mm -hmm. in cold water, I, or you can do like a, an ice, a Ziploc bag with ice water Mm -hmm. and you make sure it goes across the skin and you take a deep breath and you hold it, like hold it for a little bit, not so long that you're uncomfortable. It makes it triggers your body to say, Oh, I'm diving into cold water and I need to preserve my temperature, core temperature. So it decreases your breathing rate. It decreases your heart rate. And so it's helping tell your nervous system, like I need to chill out so that I can preserve my temperature for being under cold water. Um, and so it's actually a really like effective way to try to just quiet down your nervous system. Um, and there, you can look up YouTube videos. There's this one guy where he actually like on his smart watch, uh, you know, shows his like heart rate coming down as he, as he does it. Um, so like, that's a useful tool to actually be able to give people if they're in a moment of panic where previously they might've taken another benzo, um, or they feel like nothing is going to, to help. Yeah. That's really cool though. The the way you said that, because there, even with my own withdrawal, I looked for ways, how can I trick my nervous system? Like it's Mm -hmm. weird. It was intuitive to me. And and I did cold showers and I have clients now that do cold dips. Not everybody can do that, obviously. So this is the quick way to do a cold dip without the actual dip. Yeah. Keep a, like keep a, a wet washcloth in the freezer or, or a little Ziploc bag of ice water. Whew. So, so that's a good question though, um, that I, I didn't, uh, prepare beforehand, but like, what is happening? Like when we are tapering and we're withdrawing, I, I guess we're feeling that I always say like, we can look at it like an injury, but you can also look at it. Like it's part of my healing. Like my body's <laughs> trying to rebalance. So like what is going on as we're decreasing and then maybe when we're off and we're healing and there's bind, what do we know about that? Like what is going on? I mean, I think as you're decreasing and this is where there's a, um, Mark Horowitz, one of his papers has a, a nice graph where he shows like, this is why you want to make smaller decreases is because each time your body needs to set a new homeostasis. If you do a big decrease, then from where you were to where your body needs to create a new homeostasis is much greater than making a bunch of small decreases. Um, And so it's just that your nervous system is, you know, trying to recalibrate for how much inhibition do I have and how much excitation, what do I need to keep, you know, you awake, alert, breathing, functioning, able to run away if you need to, you know, able to assess your environment. Um, And so, I mean, which is the argument for overall smaller percentage cuts, but I think again, everyone's nervous system is so unique. Um, it kind of varies what that means. Um, so I think that's the kind of acute, um, withdrawal phase. I think with bind, we don't know yet. And this is where I parallel it to long COVID. Um, and actually with alcohol withdrawal, we know this too. There's certain pre there's some predisposing factors and alcohol withdrawal. They actually, and I, I'm now, Someday I will pursue at least outreaching to people that have studied this to be like, would you look at this in, in benzodiazepines? But in alcohol withdrawal, there's some research on the genetic, like genetic markers in GA- of like parts of GABA that predict who's going to have more severe alcohol withdrawal. Mm. Alcohol is not ex- acting on the exact same place on the GABA receptor um, as a benzodiazepine, but it is acting on the GABA receptor. So I have to wonder if there's a similarity that why we see some people that are just so exquisitely sensitive and some of them after very short periods of time on not a, a lot. Um, so that's where, that's where bind and thinking that there's some sort of injury, like a, a one of, as we've been working on getting papers published to kind of put forth this idea. Um, one of our, our senior colleagues, uh, faculty colleagues, his name's Dr. Peter Martin. He's at Vanderbilt was saying, you know, it's, probably both the neuro adaptation. So it is your nervous system trying to adapt as well as there probably is some injury or neurotoxicity. Um, you know, is it that your body becomes impaired at 
reaching that homeostasis or the rate at which it reaches the homeostasis after you make a decrease um, that it takes longer. And what we don't know is the kind of why, you know, and to what degree, like I said, it seems to be a genetic, you know, there's got to be some genetic predisposition. Like most things, it's probably a combination of genetics and then other hits Mm -hmm. to the system. Um, Whether that's, you know, other physical health problems, other medications that you're on, um, uh, just things that are, you know, unique to each person's um, biology and physiology. Um, And that probably then also explains why, you know, we get this, like they're seeing with long COVID, this waxing and waning, someone can feel like they're doing really well. And then if their body is under stress because they get sick, because they're stressed because they have something coming up or they start not sleeping well, that that some of those symptoms are going to return. And it's, you know, it's not because they're making it up or it's unrelated. It's, it's Mm -hmm. because, you know, our, your system, you've now overstressed the system and it it can no longer compensate um, as, as it was before that new stressor came on board. To someone who suffered uh, from this for years, unfortunately, um, it felt like to me, because, you know, I was trying to figure it out. I even took like anatomy and physiology class to try to like learn more about the nervous <laughs> system, like what is happening to me? But it very much, I, I don't think we know. I don't think we're any closer to knowing. We're really far away from it, honestly. And it made me be really humble. Like, we don't know anything about the human body. What are we thinking? And especially the nervous system. No, especially the nervous system. But what it felt like to me was that, and what it's felt like over time, because I'm seven years off now, but I still have this hypersensitivity to stress. I still feel extremely overstimulated in certain environments. And I, it feels kind of raw. Like there's Mm -hmm. not enough something there to calm it down. Like something is missing. That's supposed to tell me everything's fine. Cause there's no reason I should be anxious right now. I'm fine. I Mm -hmm. want to go to whole foods. There's no fear there. What it's, it's not a tiger. It's whole foods, you know? Yeah. Anyway, anyway, so that's what it felt like, but it also has felt like, um, some kind of excitotoxicity now for me, cause I was cold turkeyed from one milligram of Ativan, which is not a small amount. I understand what you're saying. Like you drop from one milligram to nothing. Your, your body's like, what the hell did you just do? But do we know anything about excitotoxicity, like the glutamate, like too much? I mean, we know that it's going to increase, right. When you, when, when you have this inhibition and we know that, um, I mean, this is why people are at risk for withdrawal seizures as well, is that you have that increase because it's trying to overcome this chronic inhibition. And then if you take away the chronic inhibition, um, suddenly it's unchecked and the nervous system's overexcited. I mean, that's why the, the most severe acute withdrawal symptoms and life threatening is, is a seizure. Where it comes from, yeah. Um, and so, right. If, I mean, that's the most kind of severe example of an overactive nervous system. Yeah. Um, and then some people are, you know, just also biologically predisposed to already have a more reactive nervous system, whether they're the people like myself, I'm hyper reflexive, obviously, like I can, think my arm jumped just hitting it with my hand. Um, uh, So some like certain ways, I mean, actually before medical school, I was a research assistant doing um, evaluating patients with psychosis Mm -hmm. and their family members and trying to look for commonalities among even unaffected individuals versus individuals that had schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. And they could see there were certain traits that like a family member that was not affected might have Mm -hmm. Um, but it was probably a combination of traits, um, that contributed to kind of an overloading for that individual. And I guess, you know, I think something similar probably applies. I mean, there's some people I'm always amazed that even though I'm like, please don't stop your meds cold, cold Turkey. Um, you know, even their antidepressants, they still do. And they're like, no, it's fine. And I'm like, okay, one, you've probably like, please be aware next time, please don't do that. Um, but also there are some people that do seem to be on the less sensitive end that's like shocking and then other people where you're like you are you know extremely sensitive which is probably in part you know medication duration um if you've had any kindling from like previous cold uh turkey stops or abrupt um really big drops um but some of them again you're like i can't explain it for that but all i can say is you like there's something in your unique physiology nervous system um maybe it's like yeah. yeah. And I think like, it's, it's also like part of our personality or our ability to deal with these severe symptoms. You know, I have some, some clients that are like, I can't do this. I won't do this. I I'm not doing this. 
And I'm like, okay, well, we have to, like, how can we, how can we, and we work through that, you know, and, and it's, it's incredibly hard. It is so hard, but I think even like our disposition to like handle it, like me, I was in the military, so I am used to pain, not pain like this, but like mm-hmm. I've, I've worked that muscle before, you know, in some ways, but it's so hard. Um, okay. So my next question is there's a controversy between if you're on multiple drugs, do you do the benzo first or the benzo last? What do you, what do I you mean, think? I think like most things, you know, we don't have the the research to say for sure. I think the, the, the right medication to do is the one that has the patient's body in and, and there's nothing to say you don't start with one and maybe you pause it if you start finding that you're, they're feeling the withdrawal symptoms more severe, and then you work on another. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say on the one hand, I mean, I am in agreement that our society as a whole is greatly over medicated with psychiatric medications. And I also see the portion of people that without some of these meds, not Mm -hmm. usually long-term benzodiazepines, but without some of the meds, um, they wouldn't function or in the case of some of my patients that suffer with substance use disorder that if, you know, I may initially have to stabilize them on, on more meds for, um, trauma and other things just to allow them to be able to get into doing the other work and get enough, uh, time without the other substances and then taper them off these meds, you know, as many meds as they can. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's never all or nothing. I think each, each individual has to figure out for themselves which medications do the benefits outweigh the risks and which ones is it that the side effects or the risks of it are greater than I, that, that, than they want to do, which means needing to have a provider, which I know is much easier said than done, that is able and willing to have those discussions of, you know, so thinking about sometimes we use side effects of certain meds in our favor, like a med is more sedating. So we may not want to take that, you know, that one away if it's lower risk than the benzodiazepine. So maybe you leave the more sedating med to help taper the benzodiazepine so that you're less likely to disrupt sleep or you leave the, you know, the med that is also helping prevent some anxiety, um, uh, to get down, you know, so some of it is, I guess I will often suggest we try to taper what seems like the higher risk med. Um, so if they're on, I mean, if they're on a lot of benzo and opioid, I'm going to say, ideally, we should do one of these because we know this is a big risk for unintentional overdose. Right. Um, or we know, you know, you have breathing problems and this is also further risk. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's not that obvious as far as what an acute risk is, um, then I think you I mean always, you know, deferring to a patient. And I, I just yesterday so overheard, I was not my patient, but when the patients a resident was staffing where they had a plethora of meds. And they're like, where do we even start? And they just started, they said to the patient, these are the ones we think are like the most likely affecting your thinking and your energy and your focus. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want to try to decrease first? They chose and they came back two weeks later. And it was like, the the resident was like, this was the best visit ever. Like they were saying, my friends say I'm acting more like myself. They're thinking more clearly. And that was just from decreasing one of like a plethora of medications they were on. Yeah. Um, and it was such a good experience for the, the prescriber, the patient, everything. And it was like a very collaborative process. That's good. That's good. I like that. Well, everybody in the office, we, or I'm sorry, everybody in the audience, we have only seven minutes left. So if you have a question, send it. I think we got one question, but let me, I think it's about an antidepressant. Let me see. Oh, something about, have you heard about the comp genetic mutation? I have it my body is missing in an enzyme that breaks down norepinephrine. What do you know about like genetic variants, like the comp T I know MTHFR is always popular. I don't know. You might not be able to answer that. You're not, is there any, yeah, I mean, there, you know, they keep studying all these psychopharmacogenomic testing. What I tell patients is there's not enough, enough evidence yet for it to be the default recommendation that we test it in patients. It can be helpful in telling us something about either how patients metabolize medications. That's how most of it works is it tells you about someone's unique like liver proteins and most, mm-hmm. most of our meds are med, psychiatric meds are metabolized through the liver, not all, but most. Um, and then there's a few variations, like there's a serotonin transporter gene, there's the COMPT, there's MTHFR, um, which seem to play a role in um, 
effectiveness of some of these meds, but many of those um, don't yet have en enough evidence that, for instance, uh, Medicare will cover, like Medicare is very specific of which ones they'll cover. And it's based on, is there enough studies to say that this, you know, that th the number needed to treat is beneficial or it's going to make a, a benefit. So um, it might, you know, with the, I, I actually haven't um, gotten information back for any patient where it didn't, it was on the comp. I would have to like look that up more. I mean, I think it would tell me, okay, maybe a medication that's targeting norepinephrine is not going to be as effective. Um, and, uh, but, but that doesn't mean for sure. I mean, yeah. I, just don't I, think I think we're so, we're so in the infant tile stage of this. We don't even know. Yeah. And, and, and what I we even... don't know a lot of times is just because something we know something like mechanistically like, Oh, you're deficient in this. It doesn't always translate to how like to the effectiveness right. of a medicine or the side effect. Like there's often so many factors. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's one piece of information. Um, unfortunately, I can't, we don't yet have the test that says mm -hmm. this is the medication that will be most useful. This is the one you should avoid. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I hope don't so. Know. I even think genetically, I don't, it might not even matter what genes you have. These drugs are that powerful that they alter your nervous system everyone's, you know, or maybe to a point for some. And I don't know. I don't know. I'm just yeah. saying we don't know. Yeah. I mean, we don't know. I, I think there's all there, unfortunately in, in all of medicine, but especially um, anything involving brain and nervous system, um, you know, just like we've seen with a lot of meds, they, they come around we see what they're useful for. And unfortunately then we learn the things that um, are less helpful or that are risks with them. Yeah. Um, and I think certainly a big thing has been, you know, really, I think hopefully teaching prescribers how to do a more gentle uh, taper with patients mm -hmm. on any psychotropic meds yeah. um, so that because we know that the more gentle you are, the, the better a patient will have in reachieving that homeostasis. And it will be easier for us to delineate what is a return of the symptoms we started this medication for and what is actually just some discontinuation or withdrawal from these yeah. medications. That's a, that's a good point. I want to, I wanted to ask you about deprescribing. So I've been following the Google alert deprescribing for about six years. Mm -hmm. I can only tell you maybe three times in all those years, have I seen anything about deprescribing of any psychiatric drugs or benzos in particular? So I know, I think in Colorado, you're working on a deprescribing clinic. Maybe that was a secret. I don't know. Not a secret. I mean, it's more of trying to figure out when and how to do it, because as you know, uh, yeah, many forces opposing that or yeah, money needed, many. So where do you see the future of deprescribing, especially benzos? Um, yeah. Is I mean, it happening? I, what do you think? Yeah. As I mentioned, well, one, I think is some, hopefully some development of medications that lend it themselves uh, to helping more people more smoothly deprescribe without having to go to all these lengths that uh, are very time consuming and resource heavy and not everyone can do. And even those that do, I think lose uh, a lot of, um, have to use a lot of energy on it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think drug development, I think, um, while a deprescribing clinic would be great, maybe for the more severe cases, I've decided that actually the higher yield would be initially figuring out how do we support uh, primary care and in general psychiatry, but the rates of prescribing are, are, are really have increased in primary care. They yes, yeah. remain static in psychiatry. And at least where I practice, we almost never start a patient on a benzo except for potentially giving them that short-term script for an acute stressor. Mm -hmm. But we inherit many patients that have been on chronic benzos, um, uh, often start in primary care, not always. Mm -hmm. Um, and so how do we support primary care who have are on the front lines of how do we deal with, you know, life's stressors and distress and um, so that they feel comfortable engaging in this process with patients. So that's where I kind of, I'm thinking that's like true. hub and, yeah, hub and spoke model, doing some sort of, you know, offering um, mentorship or um, consultation, consult, consultation yeah. to providers. Um, Cause that's what we also saw again, to sound like a broken record, but work well with, um, an opioid use disorder with NB-buprenorphine, 
and getting people more access was you meet them where they are. And yeah. with benzodiazepines, most of them are, are prescribed in primary care. Yeah, I like that as the primary focus of where can we target and make the most good. Yeah, I like that. And help the most people. Yes. So last question, um, a person's asking about, I'll just say in a general way, updosing, rescue doses, playing with a dose. Can you tell me about that? I think, you know, I think the what it's just really difficult because if we know you've developed tolerance, then we don't know where the ceiling is. Like, right, if you keep updosing, you're just like, you're going to just build, continue to build tolerance. I think what you do want to try to do is work with the medication in your favor. So figuring out, do I need to dose this more times per day? So I can't tell you how many times the patient all say, well, let's try once we, as we're cross tapering to Valium, let's try three times a day Valium. Let's try mm-hmm. four times a day. Um, the other thing is that depending what the symptoms are for some of these meds, the the anti-anxiety effect is shorter lived than the other kind of anti-withdrawal effect. So, you know, if they took their, if you took your um, vital signs, they wouldn't necessarily go up um, and show signs of physical withdrawal, like as far as your heart rate increasing or breathing um, uh, as soon as you feel other things, like you're the return of anxiety um, or irritability, or maybe some of the other um, symptoms. So I think trying to think dosing more times a day, not necessarily changing the dose. Um, um, not to say never say never if someone's in so like just absolutely not tolerating it. But I think what would be better is go slower, do a slower decrease, mm-hmm. pause, stay on that longer and then continue rather than trying to, you know, go back. Plus okay. psychologically, it just doesn't make anyone feel good to have to feel no. like they had to go back. Yeah. Well, excellent. Oh my God. I could talk to you another hour. I know. We're, we're both have to stay on schedule. I'm so yes. sorry. We didn't get to the other questions, but thank That's you all. Okay. For, thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. I feel like one day we will get our reward because like we're changing this and you're like yeah. at the spearhead of it. So thank you for all your work at the Colorado consortium. I'm not even going to try to say the rest of it yeah. and the Alliance. Um, thank you all for joining us next week. We have Adora from the benzodiazepine Um, Alliance for Best Practices. And she's going to talk about advocacy and how you can get more involved. So if people want to follow your work, I'm sure you don't want multiple emails, but how do people find out? I'm on LinkedIn and then through the the Alliance LinkedIn and the Alliance webpage where we post, you know, kind of all the things that, um, that we're doing. Um, And when we have presentations coming up and um, things that people can can be involved in. So that's, those are probably the best ways to, to get a hold, a hold of me. So, so, so great to see you again. And you too. Thank we'll, you. We'll and last started. thing, I always like to end on hope. Can you give us two yeah. sentences of hope and then we'll hang up two sentences of hope <laughs> or well, one, I think anything, I mean, any decrease is an improvement and I have seen people, um, who had an abnormal, uh, like cognitive screening normalize as we got them on less benzodiazepine. So, um, I, you know, I've, I have a lot of stories of hope of people feeling so much better, um, just as they get down, not even that they have to be completely off. Um, so don't underestimate and find, I think, look for the support and the reinforcement, um, through the Colorado Consortium, we've developed a peer support curriculum that we're starting to train people in, um, to help with that. So look for those, um, those supports. Cause I think, um, that's such an important part of surviving in this world and, and feeling like you can manage. So. This is it. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, have a wonderful day. Care. Thank you everybody in the audience. See you later. Bye. Mm-hmm.